our first presentation today, we're going to hear Revolution or Evolution, how M&A is changing the hosting market. Please welcome to the stage the Research Director of European Services at 451 Research, and to introduce him, let's take a quick look at this introduction video. Consolidation is a huge trend in the hosting industry, with several large companies making huge market gains through inorganic growth. But is an acquisition what smaller companies should aim for, or can some succeed without merging? Our next speaker has examined industry M&A trends and will offer insights into how hosting providers can navigate a market seemingly dominated more and more by big name companies. Cloud capabilities are evolving. In the first phase of the cloud, it was about um, early adopters getting into new markets. It was about disruptive innovation. Where we're going to now, we're kind of transitioning to cloud 2.0 which is where we see sustained innovation, where we see critical applications being hosted in a cloud environment, where we're seeing wide-scale enterprise adoption. Now, we're not quite there yet. We're in this kind of transitionary phase. Ladies and gentlemen, the Research Director of European Services at 451 Research, Mr. Rory Duncan. Can you hear me okay at the back there? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I've been told, uh, here's my water, thank you. Um, I've been told by the, uh, the stage director, who's just uh, passing me by now, thank you, that uh, I need to make sure I stand here uh, where there's a, a white T so that everybody can see me. Uh, I asked, well, can I use the laser pointer to you know, point at things on the screen? He said, whatever you do, you know, don't do that because if you turn around, Everybody will see your ass. Now, maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. But actually, it's probably a very good thing because, and I kid you not, um, on the way here this morning, I dropped my phone on the ground. I was listening to music, and uh, I, I bent to pick it up, and I ripped my trousers. <laughs> so I really cannot turn around. I kid you not, it was so embarrassing. So if you see me turning around, just say, don't turn around, Rory, because that would be a, uh, that would be a really bad thing. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have time to go back and change. Um, anyway, so there we go. So thanks all for staying. Um, I always think that uh, you know day three of the show is like the new day one, uh, where we have some really good content. But as we said earlier, uh, a lot of this is about uh, taking a, a slightly different look uh, at the business aspects of working in the hosting industry. And today, I'm going to talk about uh, three things. Uh, the first one is having a quick overview of the of M&A in the hosting market, then talk about who's buying and selling and why, and then thirdly, talk about what this means for the industry. Now, this is an overview. Uh, I've tried to make it as kind of graphical, interest, as interesting as possible. The speaker on next after me is the expert, and will talk in detail about why that is the case using his own experience of being involved in the deals. Okay, so all of you, from those in the room, how many of you have either experienced, been through a merger or an acquisition in the companies that you're in or you own? How many of you experienced that? Quite a few. And I think that mirrors, in this particular market, the way that it's going. So, you know, technology, uh, innovation, uh, keeps a pace, mergers and acquisition processes uh, keep going. Now, my own experience started um, uh, around about, tw is it 24? Yes, 24 years ago uh, it was announced. Um, does anybody remember uh, Aldous PageMaker? Yeah, hooray, thank you. Okay, so this is, I was like 24, 23, 24 years old, uh, giving, my, giving away my age now, but a merger was announced. It was a stock swap merger uh, with Adobe and Aldous. Now, at the time, it was going to create the fourth largest software company in the world. Times have changed, clearly. But it was a merger, and it was seen as a combination of two great companies at that point when uh, um, graphics, desktop publishing, and self-publishing was coming to the fore. There was discussion about a new name. This company would have a new name, right? 
So unfortunately, my colleague Stuart and myself were a little bit more cynical at the time. Maybe we still are. So we got our oldest corporate t-shirts and cut out Adobe logo we printed out on the laser printer and stuck it over our t-shirts and, and walked around the office. Sure enough, after about five minutes, our marketing director, my boss, called us in and, and uh, shouted at us for potentially uh, affecting the morale of the company. But of course, we were right. Uh, Aldous and Adobe became Adobe, and such is the way of things. And in many reasons, this is why it's important to look at M&A, not just about what's happened, but why. Mergers clearly can take many different forms. For those of you who know about mergers and acquisitions from a, a strategic perspective, they can be horizontal, they can be vertical when you acquire a company from your supply chain into the organization. They can be conglomerate, they can be mixed conglomerate. But generally, if you were to Google and find do an image search on merger, this is the kind of thing you see, right? It's a happy handshake. It's a collaborative, collegiate type of process. It's about combining the brains, the best of things together uh, in order to get you know, a better uh, result, a better whole at the end of the day. But of course, acquisitions can take many forms as well. But there are subtle differences. You know, in many ways, I've used the big fish eating the medium-sized fish, eating the small fish as an example to give you a clue about what I'll be talking about in the next few slides. Acquisitions can often be seen as uh, creative, but they can also be destructive. In the case of Aldous and Adobe, for example, a number of great products uh, fell by the wayside. Does anybody remember a product called PhotoStyler? If you do, there's an extra beer tonight from me to you. PhotoStyler? Well, imagine if you said today, hey, I don't think that photo's real, I think it's fake. It must have been PhotoStyled. No. Clearly not. PhotoStyler was killed off when Photoshop 1.0 came out, and the rest is history. So that fell by the wayside. Aldous Freehand, if anybody remembers Aldous Freehand. Hooray! Got the oldest lover in the, in the room today. It was killed off because Adobe had Illustrator, right? But this is the way of things. This is the way of acquisition. Sometimes it's about killing the competition. But also, in many ways, it's about uh, combining companies together and creating a competitive, competitive environment uh, that can uh, bring new innovation. In some ways, some people would say, in fact, acquisitions are good because rather than two competing companies spending marketing dollars, time and energy uh, competing with each other, it actually makes for a much more efficient use of investment funds. There is a human aspect as well, but clearly, um, at the end of the day, this is something that's been going on for many years. Okay, so. What do we think mergers and acquisitions are all about? Sure, they're about innovation. Sure, they're about bringing new products to market. But of course, a lot of it comes down to money, OK? Financial mathematics. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here. I know the next speaker will talk a little bit more about. But clearly, when it comes to mergers and acquisitions, we're talking about addition, subtraction. So what does one and one make? Well, in the world of uh, mergers and acquisitions, it's a minimum of two, right? But preferably three or four. This shouldn't be news to anybody, um, but certainly what we've seen, and I need to refer briefly to my notes here, uh, is the fact that we've seen recently, in terms of valuations for some of these acquisitions, multiples of eight to 10 times EBITDA for hosting companies. And for some of the more specialist acquisitions for things like if you have a package of infrastructure assets and cloud services, some in the region of 10 to 12 times EBITDA. And those are, those are very major multiples. The issue we have, though, is how do we find out what those numbers are? And I talked with my colleagues in, the, in our M&A team, and they uh, produced the numbers for us on all of the acquisitions and all of the mergers that they've seen. And if you look here, going from left to right, very few deals are now disclosed. I think it's like uh, one in six as compared with maybe one in three previously. If you look at the left-hand side, you'll see 2007, about 43% of deals were disclosed. Now it's about 15, and it means that it's probably been a decline, we reckon, of around about two-thirds from 2007 to 2016. Why is this? Well, in many ways, it's because the companies that are being acquired are either privately held, in other words, they're not public, 
or they're being acquired by private equity or uh, investment companies that don't make their financial tra transactions public for various reasons. It makes it very hard for me, well actually very hard for my colleagues, because they have to work harder to give me the numbers. But I think that's certainly something that is a continued trend in the technology sector. The good news is uh, that the trend is still going upwards, sort of. So this, what you're seeing is hosting company acquisitions. So I've taken out co-location and data centers and so on. So this is hosting services, the core of what most of us here are concerned with. And apart from a kind of a, a dip in 2014 and then a blip in 2015, the trend is generally upwards. It's a little bit like one of the roller coasters outside here in Europa Park. But yeah, you know, generally it's upwards. And in 2015, it was around about $8 billion uh, globally for hosting. And last year, about $6.6 .6 billion. Okay, so that's some of the numbers. Again, this is just the hosting companies. Uh, uh, and we've taken out uh, the others that are not related to hosting services. The question is, where is this happening? Now, most of you have probably seen some of the high-profile announcements. Uh, if you follow M&A, you'll see that you know, the big technology companies tend to buy each other more frequently. There is this idea that there is consolidation happening. In fact, EMEA is a key part of this M&A uh, market. The number of deals in EMEA has increased steadily. If you look again from left to right, because I'm not going to turn around, uh, going from 23% in 2013 to 38% in 2016. That's a steady increase. And why is this? These are the number of companies that have been acquired in EMEA in the hosting industry as a percentage of all the deals. Again, a lot of this is down to the fact that EMEA is hot. Many of the companies that you guys work in or you work with uh, are seen as uh, important to increase footprint, to increase the kind of services that are on, or, that are on offer. Many of them are small, okay, having regional footprint. Uh, and this is increasing the number. So to quickly summarize, EMEA is leading in terms of the number of new M&A deals in the hosting industry. But North America leads in terms of the dollar value. Many of these com companies in Europe are being bought by other large European, but also other large US companies. And this is seeing, we're seeing this growth here. Again, you look from left to right, you'll see the dark blue bar shows the North America spending. Okay, so far, we all right? Yeah, so I wanted to try and introduce that so that it wasn't too complex, but also you can see um, the flow in terms of where we're going. So, EMEA, lots of uh, deals being done with the purchase of small companies. The US is, is tending to lead this. Okay, next question. <clears throat> who is buying, who is selling, and why? I'd quite like to start with the why, if possible. Uh, we can see where the market is. Now, it, it doesn't take me to tell you. You guys obviously read similar things to what I read, but we've seen this huge shift in the workload. Workloads dramatically shifting to cloud. The left-hand side, if we look at today versus the next two years, Overall cloud usage is increasing quite significantly, from 41% of today's workloads to about 60% in the next two years. Uh, and we've done a breakdown now. You can see where this growth is coming from. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Where is this from? This is not something we've made up. This is from our uh, Voice of the Enterprise research, uh, which is a primary research that we have uh, that we uh, publish in data form. So we use that. And now I'm hoping having mentioned Voice of the Enterprise, that my colleague Liam Eagle is in the audience. Are you here, Liam? No, he's not here. Right. I'll see him later about that. Um, however, I didn't want to embarrass him by uh, calling him out, but he's obviously not here, so never mind. Um, my colleague Liam uh, manages one of our uh, data product sets, and uh, I can introduce any of you to him if you want to learn more about that. So, Cloud work workloads are shifting dramatically to the cloud. But at the same time, hosting is considered to be truly self-service when it comes to spend. So what we're seeing here is a planned spend uh, from the same companies uh, in terms of the services that they want. 
What are we seeing? It's, it's the fact that around 40%, sorry, 70 percent of cloud spending is now on things that are other than infrastructure services. And security is emerging as a core differentiator. Now, you'll see these percentages change slowly from left to right. So this is not something that's going to happen overnight in terms of spending plans from end users. But things like security services, things like managed services, are gradually increasing as a percentage of overall spend. And I'm sure, as you probably know, when we talk with end users, when we talk with other service providers, security is becoming a core differentiator in terms of hosting services being offered. If you ask end users, what is the one thing that is either an inhibitor or a necessity for moving workloads to the cloud? It's security. So we wanted to make sure that that was highlighted here. When it comes to M&A, the security component of any uh, transaction is extremely important when it comes to looking at the assets. Having said that, let's just take a slight reality check. Um, we then asked companies, what are the most, attribute, most important attributes when you're looking for a hosting and cloud provider? And it may come as no surprise, but it hasn't really changed since any other form of hosted service since, I guess, the beginning of time. What are the top two? Value for money, the cost, ongoing cost. What is the actual spend long term? And two, what is the service reliability in terms of uptime performance, availability, accessibility, and so on? Those two generally don't change. Now, before you say it, I'm not saying that anything else lower down on the list is not important. Uh, it's just that these two tend to appear at the top. Brand is still important. Breadth of services features is still important. Technical expertise, customer support, and so on. But companies, at the end of the day, they want those two things, value for money, and they want to know that they're going to get a re uh, reliable service from companies that they can trust, and, some, and that, so that never changes. So we've looked at some of the whys. Um, what about the who? Many of you will know what I'm going to be talking about next, but if we look at uh, the top five hosting deals in 2016, here they are. Apollo buying Rackspace, uh, GoDaddy buying Host Europe, United Internet buying Strato, and then Great Hill buying Evolve, and Datapipe buying Adapt. Some of these are actuals. I hasten to add some of these are estimates. But these are the top five. And if you look at the total, um, that's what, six, six and a half uh, billion or so in total, making up a sizable percentage of the total market for uh, M&A and hosting. So those are the top five. Um, and who is it that's doing this? We have, um, I guess we call them serial acquirers. Some companies buy lots of companies. Some only do it occasionally. Um, and if you'll see here, I know many of you are from the UK, some are from other countries. But if you see, there's a few companies there. Clarinet, Six Degrees Group, uh, and Iomart are key pan-European and UK-based hosting companies. And they are buying many. I also hasten to add that these are the ones that we know about. There are probably many others that we don't know about. The, the second point to reiterate about this is these are maybe buying many companies, but do they necessarily mean that they're spending a lot of money? And if you look at the total value here, you can see that that's the case. Clarinet buys many, many different companies, but perhaps the total spend in the last 12 hasn't been over 100 million. These are targeted niche acquisitions for specific markets and for specific requirements and types of services. Are we okay so far? Okay, fine. Um, <clears throat> next question is, and I'm sure many of you can answer this, you know, what are these companies looking for? They're looking for scale, footprint, or they're looking for services. In fact, increasingly, many of these acquisitions are designed to create both, right? A mix of services, uh, additional scale, economies of scale, uh, further footprint, and so on. So what I've done is I've split it into six sections, uh, outlining the different types of assets that uh, will bring value. How many of you uh, own data centers or own data center space? OK. How many of you would like to have more space available? Yeah. And then depending on where you are, you know, if, if you're in Iceland, you've got, some, uh, you've got quite a lot of space available, but it's a challenge, perhaps, on connectivity and uh, some, of the other, uh, uh, some of the other aspects in terms of persuading customers to host there. There's lots of data center space for sale in Switzerland, for example. If you're in Frankfurt, it may well be you have to join the back of the queue or pay a lot to have it. So the first thing 
we see from an M&A perspective that is, a, is attractive is data center space. If you're acquiring a company and they have already got some data center space, that's a real asset, it's a real advantage. The second part is, I call them retained customers. I know for any of you who were at the, the GoDaddy presentation yesterday morning, uh, the CEO talked about the value of a loyal customer uh, staying with the company over years. Acquiring a company with many customers, you've got additional footprint uh, in, certain, in um, uh, regional markets, but also you've got a bunch more customers you can sell to. The third point, part, part, excuse me, is talent. When we're talking about core hosting, we're adding uh, managed services, we're adding cloud services. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's difficult to keep up with uh, the latest um, uh, programming languages, operating systems, communications protocols, and so on. The issue we have is skills and talent in the hosting market. And before anybody says, hey, well, don't we have this issue everywhere? For sure. Um, Amazon Web Services in the UK are planning, they're saying, in order for them to meet their current commitments to where they're going in the market, they need to recruit, just in the UK, an additional 1,000 people. They're planning to do that this year and next year. So even the biggest of the cloud giants are having issues trying to get the people in that they need if they're introducing these new services. The third part is then vertical market capabilities. If we look at Clarinet, remember they, they uh, acquired 16 companies. Uh, they've done it quite cleverly. For example, Clarinet have a large market in France. Uh, what do you do if you want to develop your market in, let's say, selling uh, public sector hosting and healthcare in France? What do you do? Well, like Clarinet did, you buy the company that has the one certification from the French government to supply hosting to the healthcare industry. So that's the kind of thing, targeted ver vertical market capabilities. The third one is managed services capabilities. Uh, you saw one of the deals there was uh, with Datapipe. Uh, they bought a company called Adapt. Uh, Adapt had some fairly advanced uh, capabilities and certifications for selling uh, managed AWS services. Uh, Datapipe bought them and hence uh, got those capabilities. And last but not least, regional presence. Regional presence uh, gives us the capabilities to uh, uh, approach new markets uh, with common language, with local data centers uh, that are able to provide uh, regional storage for compliance, uh, for security, for regulatory purposes. So those are the six. Does that sound okay so far? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I would like now, and I'll just take a sip of water, to do a case study for you, uh, just to try and illustrate some of these things. So we've all heard of GoDaddy, right? Fine, okay. Um, <clears throat> you may have heard that they recently bought a company called Host Europe Group. Are either, any of you here with either of those companies? Okay, great. But it's not as simple as that, and I guess I'd like to illustrate some of the things we've talked about this morning with this. Of course, Host Europe has all of these brands and companies behind it. Sys Group, Telefonica Germany Online Services, Domain Factory, and last but not least, Intergenia. Intergenia, of course, in the last few years has made its own acquisitions. It, in, it uh, acquired internet24.de and before that, uh, other brands. But that's not the end of it because, of course, GoDaddy itself has made recent purchases. Aptix public cloud capabilities, uh, the domain name portfolio of worldwide media, uh, Media Temple itself, uh, smart name, and so on. And as you can see, effectively what we have is a new kind of company. We all know about Endurance International Group in the US, which is made up of uh, multiple brands. Here we're seeing the emergence of a mega hoster, which is multiple brands connected in certain ways covering a variety of different markets, uh, offering a bunch of different managed services with talent to address those, okay? And that kind of addresses maybe four or five of those key uh, value-added parts that I mentioned before. And what's interesting is that, you know, perhaps in the past, uh, GoDaddy would have rebranded everything, you know, so Media Temple would be, you know, uh, GoDaddy uh, Public Cloud or um, Host Europe would become you know, GoDaddy Europe or something. No. The value here is that by retaining the identity 
of each of these component parts, GoDaddy can address through its regional presence the requirements of markets in different countries uh, around the world. Okay, so the mega host is, is arriving. But of course, this doesn't happen just organically. Um, and I know perhaps there may be a few investors, private equity firm uh, companies in the room. Anybody here from a private equity or venture capital firm? No, they may be coming for the next session. But many of the companies that we, that we know uh, are representing the, the hosting market. So companies like Oakley Capital, DH Capital, Sinvin, Darwin, Many of the companies I've talked about already have been owned by these equity firms in the past. And I've got this wheel because they often they tend to kind of revolve and the ownership moves between these companies. But that's not all. Um, we've got companies like Lombard in the UK. They're a debt provider. They look at the kind of financial fundamentals as opposed to IPO. They're seeing uh, much more interest recently in uh, kind of exit strategies for many of the smaller hosting firms. They're also joined by companies like the Cloud Equity Group that made four purchases in 2016. Uh, Cloud Access, Buffalo Web Services, Comfort Host, and NodeServe. Uh, we've also seen companies like MC Partners. They made five investments since 2015. And then also, last but not least, there's Charles Bank, uh, who target the mid-market, and they worked with companies like uh, Six Degrees Group to finance many of the acquisitions uh, that were made. Okay, so we've looked at who's buying, why they're buying, and the value that they're taking uh, from this, and so on. So we're okay to do the last section, last few slides. Okay, fine. So what does this mean for the industry? Well, <clears throat> I guess, you know, the hosting industry continues to adapt and evolve. And we're seeing this as an evolution. The title of my presentation was, is it revolution or evolution? It's difficult to tell in many ways. I think certainly what we've seen is, is the market maturing. And it follows the maturity model. So when we diverge, we create choices. We have new technology, new players, new providers. At the moment, we're at this middle part, which is, I would say, the emerge part. Companies are exploring their choices. Cloud has arrived has created this sort of disruption. Many people are saying it can create this kind of revolutionary environment, but we're still emerging. The emergence of many of the mega hosters and the largest uh, multi-brand companies I see as being the converging part of where we are, where more companies are making choices. And we're finding that the mega hosters, in many ways, are being able to challenge the largest of the pure play cloud services companies. We see them separating along definable lines. We've got web and application, and application hosting companies targeting Soho and SMB. We've got the hosting and managed services firms emerging as a group targeting SMB and SME. And then we're seeing on the right-hand side these evolved and or pure play cloud hosters who are targeting the technology media sector, TMT sector, the large enterprise sector, the startups, and the greenfield sites, and so on. And this separation um, is creating uh, another, er another layer of choices for customers uh, and introducing these new uh, business models. There's also the managed service providers, the niche specialists, who are bringing in these uh, options for larger portfolios, cloud platforms, premium support, hybrid cloud and service segmentation, value-added SaaS for backup, disaster recovery, security, as well as things like SMB, mid-market bundles, and so on. Partnering with many of these companies that are emerging is creating this sort of the sticky services that we see creating lo loyalty and binding customers uh, to the hosting firms. Okay, so <clears throat> five key takeaways, uh, and then we can maybe do a quick uh, round of Q&A. M&A activity continues to increase in Europe, particularly driven by uh, venture capital and private equity investment. The consolidation we're seeing happening is mirroring the maturity model in the hosting market. Cloud is an opportunity for sure, but it does require careful investment, particularly from an M&A side. We are seeing these mega hosters, these supersizing uh, activities. It is creating bigger portfolios, but also indeed more competition. And then, um, 
We're seeing the emergence of these ecosystems of managed specialists creating these sticky services, enhancing the offerings that many of these uh, mega hosters are providing. And I guess at the end of the day, as I mentioned, is this a revolution or an evolution? Well, the hosting market adapts and evolves, as I said. It meets cloud, which is potentially revolutionary. What happens? Well, I guess my view is we have a quiet revolution. We talked about, uh, historically, there was the, the, um, the velvet revolution, it was called. It was this gentle uh, revolution that happened. Um, and I see this as something that has a result of cloud becoming this disruptive factor in the hosting industry. At the end of the day, um, as cloud matures, the hosting market will continue to go on um, and will con continue to consolidate. I wanted to leave you with one message, which was whether you're a mega hoster or a small regional player, whether you're a cloud specialist or a web hosting specialist, customers generally want the same things, right? They want value for money. They want a transparency in terms of pricing, in terms of what you're offering in an SLA. They're wanting some kind of reliable service and a relationship with you uh, that's based on trust. Thank you for listening. Rory Duncan, ladies and gentlemen. Rory Duncan, Research Director, European Services 451 Research. We have a little bit of time. We can have two questions. Who would like to ask the first question? Okay, let's move straight to the second question. Who would like to ask the second question? We might even have room for a third question. Oh, <laughs> this rate. The answers are very succinct, I like that. Yeah. What we're gonna do is have some fun. Pass me the box, this is the magic box. This is the mobile microphone. So to ask a question, or to get the box, you have to ask the question. Who would like to ask a question? And you have to keep your eye on the box, otherwise if it hits you on the head, yeah. it is soft, but still, it's a bit of a surprise. Yeah. A question could be, you know, who cuts your hair? Something like that, something insightful. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> who's question. Gonna, who's gonna mend my trousers? You know, I don't know. The prize for the question is a copy of the book of our last speaker of the day, 315 in this room, Laurie, Laura Decker, who is the youngest person to circumnavigate the world. Ah, question, why don't I can't throw that far? Oh, I love a challenge, but there's a limit. Okay, so work as a team. I'll pass it to someone in the middle and you pass it to the guy at the back. Are you ready? Oh, good catch. Three. Now it's going one level back to the guy right at the back with, yeah, uh, near it, one more time. If the microphone works, I'll be surprised. Okay, thank you. Okay, question. Okay. What I've noticed I can't, no, speak into it. Okay. No, into the My box. Is, uh, no, speak into the box, please. The box oh. has a microphone in it. Hello. Ah, don't shout. Okay. Um, <laughs> Anthony Notus from Holland. I have Hi. a question. Uh, in your presentation, I have noticed a kind of a uh, regional uh, focus. Uh, you are talking mainly on UK uh, hosting companies. Um, but the, what's, hap what's happening in the rest of Europe? Uh, uh, I expect in Southern Europe there are also a lot of uh, hosting companies, or in uh, uh, Eastern Europe there are a lot of hosting companies, but I don't see anything of it in, uh, in the complete presentation. Great question, let me reframe the question. As we're moving into post-Brexit, the rest of Europe doesn't exist. <laughs> yes. Um, as a... <laughs> as now a, the real answer. You know, as, a, as a Remain voter and as a Scottish nationalist, oh. I please, please will you let me back into Europe after Brexit <laughs> happens. Yeah, but to, to answer your question, um, I guess some of it's about scale, some of it's about awareness. Uh, the challenge we have is um, there clearly is a lot of uh, M&A activity happening in uh, Italy and Spain and Portugal and so on, and we do track it. Uh, had I been able to show you a longer list, we're starting to see Italian, Spanish and other companies come up there. A company like Clarinet, for example, is very active in Spain and Portugal. Um, and is doing many local acquisitions. The issue we have is the most regional of the acquisitions 
tend to be, um, let's say, slightly more off the radar. At the same time, uh, we do also monitor what's happening in uh, Eastern Europe, so we're aware of some of the local acquisitions there. Uh, if I was to, I mean, I can certainly speak with you afterwards about it, but we had to kind of figure out how do we get some of this information to you guys so you can see the top level, but illustrate that underneath there is an awful lot of activity happening at a regional level. Excellent question, thank you. We have time for one more question, I believe. Yes, send the box back slowly. Um, who would like to also ask a question? Otherwise, we'll move to our next speaker. And I'm happy to answer a question about anything to do with politics. I'm, <laughs> I'm ready. But I can recommend that you catch Rory in the corridors. Wow! Yay! I think there's, a, there's an NFL scholarship Thank for you. whoever it was that threw that. Any other takers for a question? Otherwise, we'll move to our next session. Now, I'm going to ask Rory, when he leaves, to walk out backwards just for the sake yeah. of security, I visual will. security. I would moonwalk if I could, but unfortunately <laughs> I can't. Rory, thank you so much. Rory Duncan, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, everybody, for listening.